Hello and welcome to Tavern Talks. This is, I am the wonderful host, GM Misfit, otherwise known for our wonderful show over on Sundays, The Affordables. But tonight for Tavern Talks, we have a very strange guest. Never seen this man before. Oh, wait. It's the same guy that I dealt with for like 16 episodes. No, Corey is back with us, but he's our guest tonight. He's not our host. He's not a co-host. He's nothing more than a guest, which is fantastic because that's what we want. And we have a first, mind you, the first guest to come back on our stage or in the tavern, I guess would be the best way to put it. Uh, James, who originally came in to talk about their what was it revolutionary war i believe yeah we were talking about talked about beforehand yeah we talked about uh, the a revolutionary war historical fiction thing that i ran for him uh and then this project you see behind us is what came as the game he created to run for me uh and and so and now it's 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 the first shameless plug of the evening. It will be on Kickstarter next Tuesday, the 28th. So uh, James and I are very proud of this. Um, and thanks, James, for returning. At the, <laughs> right? Episode three was the last time you were on. We're on episode 49. You've done 49 of these, James. Wow. <laughs> well, I'm happy to be back. And uh, I'm happy to, to be here to talk about In Service of the Tiger a bit more as well. Yeah, so... I know last time we talked, and we're going to bring some of these questions up again, because to me, there's a big difference between the fantasy that we play on an everyday basis in D&D &D and, you know, maybe you play science fiction like uh, Star Wars or uh, my brain is not kind of cyberpunk. There's a couple others that I'm just not clicking with at the moment, but it's different when you add historical plot to a, a story because these are actual events these are actual people that were in history and it brings some realism to the game that i didn't expect and i've actually had the opportunity to play test this game which we got a chance to play test in february when we were out at Gen uh, genghis khan in colorado and i'll tell you this is a interesting story i learned a lot I don't remember too much about it now because it was a ton of information. But if I could play <laughs> In a it slower, very short time period, <laughs> if I could play it slower, I think I would enjoy it a lot more. Yeah, um, we we did do an abbreviated version for Genghis Khan. We we tried to get all three chapters in in four hours and and realistically this is a minimum of of 20 hours of content uh of course if you take all the side quests and all of the things that you could explore more as a as a gm uh you could run a whole campaign over the what is it five years that this yeah, story takes place five over. years so uh it, it, you think five about years. games in in D D in the in-game time is like it's never five years right it's like a matter of maybe a year or two and that whole campaign you go from like level one to 20 in a year or two um so think about that when you when you think i mean i don't know a lot of people who can run a campaign from one to 20 in two years truthfully no opinion. no i mean in game two years time. of in game time oh, oh yeah 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 in game time not real sense. game not real time yeah. but uh you, you think about it, it's like one thing leads to another and you know you level mm -hmm. from one to five in like a month and a half of real in or in game time right so that that's that's something that this i i love about the the way this is put together is that it does take place over a number of years um kind of describing uh takeda shingen's um move north uh and I'll, I'll turn it over to james here to explain kind of what what the overarching without any spoilers campaign is about right well and, and before i do that I, I wanted to kind of touch on what you said james right which is that when you bring in historical fiction it's a whole different beast right <laughs> there's one thing for creating a historical setting right the, for sandbox games right there's right. another thing that's actually tracking historical events um and you know when we came on a year ago to talk about this you know you expressed your concerns about was it going to be too railroady right right um, because we're following a specific path of history um and so i think we really tried to take that to heart and make it so that it was a really fun playable adventure that doesn't feel like you were just on a set of train tracks right um no i agree yeah it was interesting 
because for a while there, you you first when you start, and I'll admit when I first started it, I was like, okay, this is extremely like just heavy lore. But I also got to remember that most people don't have the extensive background that you both have about feudal Japan, and you're trying to speed people up. And that's no different than when people like Matt Mercer start telling the story of their world before the, the next, the first campaign. So when I started piecing those puzzle pieces together and making sense of, okay, this is how you do it in D and D, this is how you do it Pathfinder. This now makes more sense. Uh, however, like you said, is we also jammed twenty to thirty hours of content into four hours. Yeah, we took out everything that could possibly be stripped out so that we could get it into the four hours at Genghis Khan. Um, right. But you know, to so I guess not too much in in spoiler in the way of spoilers right uh for this first chapter in service of the tiger we decided to follow uh, as corey mentioned takeda shingen who is one of the kind of great daimyo at towards the end of the warring states period in japan mm -hmm. um you know we pick up his story around 1550 which is when it was after he had deposed his father he had taken over as lord of kai um and was beginning his move up into Shinano, which is present day Nagano in Japan. Um, you know, and ultimately, uh, you know, a handful of years later, uh, Takeda Shingen has a, a series of epic battles over like 11 years or something with right. Uesugi Kenshin, who was known as the dragon of Echigo. Um, and so we took for this first chapter, we kind of the, the starting phases of that, that Shinano campaign um, as our setting. And of course, in service of the tiger, you know, kind of gives it away a little bit. You get to interact with Takeda Shingen, um, and you're you're kind of running through that um, that part of the Shinano campaign. Yeah. Now, I think my only my only personal concern as a GM for this would be is I would not be able to pronounce these names very well at all. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We we're, we thought about that, and we're going to add a dramatist persona in at the end as an appendix that has phonetical spellings of the names. Um, I mean, you know, I'm guessing though, a lot of times you could almost use their their titles or their nicknames for a lot of these characters, though. Yeah, so absolutely. Of calling some, you know, I'm going to mix this up tremendously, partially because I have no notes in front of me, which is normal, but because I have nothing, no background on feudal Japan other than one class that was absolutely atrocious uh, that I took in college because I thought it was cool to learn about Japanese history from the beginning until the 1600s. And uh, so you really got to learn wish... about the Nihon Shoki and oh, oh yeah, that's goodness. That's vicious. tough. It was horrific. <laughs> uh, and not to mention the books were not books. They were manuscript like. Yep scrolls that were then retranslated but translated broken so you had to read and then reread and then reread yeah um totally it was just a miserable six months like so, well, so yeah i guess be two months but yeah so in comparison to that college course um because you were a play tester i'm going to throw it at you what were your what, what did you think about the the game when you play tested it at gen con knowing that it was you know tight what were your favorite things about the way it was presented? What, what did you like about it? I like the fact that everybody in the, the group made sense. So you've got all these players, and I think we had what, six, eight? Five or and six. Many, we had five so, or six so for five each or session, six. Yeah. So here's my question, and this is something that you guys can answer because you wrote the whole thing. But how many players, pre-made players are there? There are six pre-made characters. Okay, so no matter what, six is the max that they can pick from, and they have if if they want to do over that, it wouldn't make the connection. I mean, you you could ahead. technically add them in, but the 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 problem is is that you know we heavily customize the character progression for each of our characters. Correct. Which so, is one thing I did like. I mean, truthfully, that was one of my favorite points. Was once a scenario hit, you had these little cool cards that. And flip over like oh look this is the benefit you get from completing the scenario um and it really helped with progressing the story in a more rhythmic uh way rather than just hey you leveled up and move on like 
it made sense. And if you did certain ones differently, well, you got abilities differently. So I thought that was really neat. And I thought it was a unique difference from what we're used to in modern day D&D. Yeah, yeah, you know, we'll, uh, go ahead, go ahead Corey. <laughs> <laughs> I was gonna say that's that was what he's what he's talking about the the custom character progression. Uh, I think when we started sitting down with a 5e SRD, um, we were like, okay, so what class is this person going to be? What class is that going to person going to be? And, and we kind of decided, well, we're stripping magic out altogether. We're stripping out a bunch of things. So let's not make any classes. Let's take, you know, uh, for example, one of the characters can get rage. He's not a barbarian, but depending on the choices you make, right. uh, one of the characters can, can get like a barbarian rage. Uh, another character can get like a bard. Um, uh, what's it called with the like an inspiration song or right, like yeah, rah rah chant or whatever, right? As yeah, or we... or was it the the taunting? One of them. Could... It was the taunting. It was the the, the one that does damage, um, mocking vicious mockery. He could get like a, a version of vicious mockery based on some of the choices. All of these are. You know, there's three different chapters, and there's multiple times in a chapter where you can kind of level up or do something yeah. that gets your character some extra things um and i i think that this you know it's not as aggressive though it's not as no. aggressive as a level you know i mean I, th I think that made sense too because for me personally when i'm thinking natural natural progression it doesn't take you know a month of time to learn how to properly use a sword to the point of you know, mastery, where you pick up as an adventurer at level one, and you already can use a sword perfectly, you know what I mean? But, right. and then you're getting these overabundant stats. With yours, it's like taking all of the levels that originally were there, and breaking them down even further, which I think was a unique way to do it, because it makes it more progressive as a everyday person, rather than a superhuman like you, you see in Dungeons and Dragons. Yeah, that's another thing. We didn't want, you know, the uber hero adventurers, right? We yeah. wanted people who would be in this historical setting in this time, in this period of time, right? And like Corey said, we didn't, we didn't really have classes, you know, obviously some of the characters based on their backstory have, you know, are, are oriented more towards, you could call them a traditional class, but, mm -hmm. uh, but we tried to really make them individual characters and not just you know here's a fighter here's a rogue here's a ninja right. you know <laughs> and yeah, I, it, I know that's something i brought up before when we were playing the cool thing about this that i think that really is the niche for what historic fantasy is is it made education fun like you know i could yeah. roll dice and have a good time and you can still learn the story at the same time uh, and I think this is a niche that doing in a classroom would be a lot of enjoyment because you can take on that role. You know, you can do certain things. And as long as people weren't being crazy, everything makes some sense with even how you want to play the character because you have enough of a, of a goal and a kind of a guidelines sheet that you can understand who that character really was. Um, right and, really and there are some early on uh basically they're they're kind of just character cards that mm -hmm. we hand out uh early on in the story um that are basically just to help understand the cultural part of the game mm -hmm. um so or, like it, right after the very first encounter there's something that happens and we give all the characters or all the players a card that basically says here are some things here's some role play hints that kind of fit the time fit the mold or you can do whatever but here are some things that you could choose from that kind of fit this theme uh and and it wasn't it didn't feel railroady a matter of fact that some of the playtesters said that was their favorite part is that they they didn't know much about the the time they didn't know much about the world right. and having that little role play tip card so to speak was yeah. was very helpful but it wasn't like you have to do this it was just here are some options here's some ways here's to some think suggestions about it, now that like this that. this big thing has happened 
um, that to kind of contrast Western culture, right? Right. So, yeah, because you know that's one of the biggest challenges when you're introducing something that you're trying to keep based in history, but is also in a culture that is really alien to a lot of people, especially in the Western world, unless yeah. they've studied it, right? And so we tried to sit to, to frame it as such, and like in the culture in this time period, these are the considerations that your character would have had. Your mileage may vary. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. And I think that's nifty. And I'm gonna do a single plug to GUI Cube because I think that's how their their plan is for some of these other these other continents is to really dive into some of these much more unique and different styles of living. You know, feudal Japan is much different than we lived in the Western, yeah, Western yeah. culture. And, and the other um, thing about it is, you know, in feudal Japan, honor is real. Family reputation yeah. is, is tangible. It is something that everyone feels and everyone, yeah. you know, and that and was it's frightening that, because it's very, it's very real even to this day in a lot of cultures over in that area. Because I mean, I didn't ever lived in Japan, but I lived in Korea and it's still very potent in those cultures. Family yes. is a is is not just family. It's very real to them. You know, I mean, you watch parents, grandparents, everybody goes and does things. It's not you know, and there's not as much of the whole moving around thing where people are leaving to go somewhere else. Yeah, much more conservative in, much in that conservative. aspect. Yeah. yeah. Um, so without without boring the stream um, about, you know, cultural differences. Um, yeah, because I we... could totally talk about that for like an hour. <laughs> And I, you, in all honesty, I would probably be asleep. No offense, but it's just, it's so deep. <laughs> I, I remember just listening to it and I loved it, but it was so deep. Um, so can, and, can we, can we take a break and show the intro video and then come back and talk a little bit about kind of yeah. where it's going? Yeah, let's roll it. Yes. So definitely check out this video. This this is a pretty awesome, awesome intro to their album. And kill the and kill the app. <laughs> <laughs> and, and and for anybody who wants a v, VRBO, we've got a free ad that that they didn't pay for right there, <laughs> right? <laughs> exactly. But yeah, you know, no, definitely, I... Corey has been kind of my my right hand man for a while now on tabletop misfits in the background, and one of the things he has gotten extremely good at is After Effect and Premiere. So, and you could see that just, I mean, it was funny because legitimately this is kind of a story that Corey and I have told on occasion, but the fact that we just got a, you know, a random hair that was like, you know what, we're going to figure this shit out. <laughs> and within two weeks, we were already busting out intros and that's where the Tavern Talks intro came from. And uh, you can see the skill level that has improved that Corey has brought to this uh, this Kickstarter, which is 
phenomenal choreos. So, so a little bit about um, some of the, the stretch goals. First of all, the Kickstarter is starting with a very modest goal of $1,000 um, and then uh, working its way all the way up to $10,000 um, in stretch goals that are already set up. Um, awesome. One of the first stretch goals there, because you were talking about making it fun to learn, I did a lot of um, uh, education. Those who know me know that I'm, uh, I work in education and I've traveled around doing educational um, seminars and whatnot. And one of those things was on game-based learning. And I put some of those kind of tools to work in this. And one of the first stretch goals we have is some, some lesson plans that you can use per chapter. Uh, if you wanted to actually use this in a way that you were kind of, you know, really teaching with, with this historical uh, stuff. Um, and, and so that's one of our first stretch goals. And then a lot of stretch goals are in there about artwork, like more artwork in the book. Um, and then the final stretch goal is to uh, get some of our friends, some of them who are actors on uh, Plots in Dark and Haven, um, to do uh, voiceovers of all the box text. So that's our final stretch goal is to actually put an MP3 list together so that if you wanted to run this, you'd have this uh, all the box text in the adventure uh, voice acted for you. So, um, and that's pretty, that's, that's pretty awesome. And it, and yes, when we get there, so a, it's a bit of a push, but I think it's definitely going to be an interesting, uh, improvement. That's for sure. And it'll help you with those names. Like you were talking about, we might do some exactly. MP3s and just pronunciations anyway, um, that we throw together. Yeah. So. yeah I could do a yeah. pronunciation guide or something, but you know, <laughs> it's, it's one of those things, you know, you mentioned that, it, you know, it made the learning fun, right? That's, that was one of the key drivers for us, right? When Corey, you know, back years ago now did that revolutionary war one for me, I learned a ton about the revolutionary war that I'd never known. Um, and so I tried to do a similar for him for the Japan, yeah. the Japan campaign that I did for him. Um, and obviously we took the first section and, and turned it into this. Yeah. So I know this is being a little presumptuous, but what is the, what is the future goal for this specific story? So is this the only book or are you playing, do you have projections for multiple? Kind of depends but, on the Kickstarter. Yeah, it kind of depends on no, how popular no, I guess, this is. I'm guessing more and of if what, people want it, want more of them. Would there but, be? Is there more that you have already thought about of like there's other stories that you would like to tell? So, I mean, as as kind of a general overview, the campaign I wrote for Corey was about a hundred pages of content. Mm -hmm. um, this is the first like four. Did you say four? Yeah. <laughs> Did you say four? <laughs> like, yeah. I so we, we say kind of, 40. Like, no, no. You know, this is the, this was like the very first, like four pages of of that book. And and since I have uh, I have neglected to plug my computer in, I need to go run and find my charger. I'm also going to go run and find uh, the book that he's talking about. The camp, the original. I, I've got campaign. it right here. If you want to see it. I'll All right, I'll let it. you show that off while I All get right. my charger. There we go. And Chad, if you think this is awesome, please give these guys a, you know, go to their Kickstarter, click that notify button, because that's going to help them a ton in the upcoming week before this so thing launches. This is the book that I wrote for my game with Corey. Yep. You can see how much content it is. Yeah. So, and you said four pages. Yeah, the, 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 the first four pages, basically. I've got, yeah, and I, I mean, I, I basically covered... And you embellished, I'm I'm sure. Oh yeah. On over the four pages. So so it yeah. went from four pages to how big is the book? Uh well, let's see. Of non-map content. No, no, no. I'm not talking that book. Oh. I'm talking oh, our book. book? That your your book. Yeah. What is it, yeah. like 40 or 50? You know, yeah, can't so we hear. took four pages to 50 pages, right? right? I mean, yeah, we, I mean, because a lot of the stuff that I did for him in, in our adventure, I just kind of off the cuffed it. Right. right because you knew. Your... And it was a solo adventure, right? It was right. just for Corey. So we had to flesh it out to, you know, make it playable for six characters and right. and, and things like that. Uh, and, and you know, what I did for Corey wasn't quite as in-depth either, right? It was more of a survey of, I mean, I did it over like 66 years of Japanese history or something for right. him. Um, so, 
we, we decided, you know, if we wanted to actually have it be fun to play and actually learn something, it needed to be a much smaller time period and really expand the content of it. Um, but what that, that means is that we have a ton of material where if we wanted to to do more uh, chapters, you know, we've already right. talked about what an, the next couple chapters could be. This was a lot of work. <laughs> so it really all yeah. depends on what the Kickstarter does. Yeah, Which, and, I mean, and what, that's, that's definitely the understanding. Like, that's the understanding. And I think that's the big thing with Kickstarters right now anyways, is that they're giving you that, that side of, is this what people want? And I think that's awesome. Yeah, and I think that so, it it also depends on what the fan base uh, is asking for, because I think that once we finish this Kickstarter up and we deliver this and people um, get their hands on it and, you know, we'll probably send out a survey and say, what would you like to see next in this vein? Um, would you like to see more along this? Uh, are there other historical uh, context that you might want to explore? Um, and, and just see what the, the fan base wants. I I hesitate to do like even though i did a lot of work to build out the thing for james on on the revolutionary war war i i kind of hesitate to do american history i i would really like to bring other cultures because I, that's what i loved about this one right and right. um and you know for example in the work with gooey cube uh doing that research on sandestia to see how that continent in that fantasy world is influenced by African culture. It makes me think, okay, well, could there be an, you know, African culture history adventure or something like that? So I, I think that it's really going to come down to, first of all, how well the Kickstarter does and if people like it. Right. Uh, and then, you know, if we, if we find that people really enjoy uh, looking at history through these lens, through this lens, um, seeing what the fan base wants and, and trying to, to keep, keep going. And, and I think that people might, might want to go further on this. Um, yeah. At, like an Aztec adventure that would be right. from chat. So that, yeah, that, that might be interesting, but um, like James said, it is a lot of work to take events in history, make them interesting to play, give player agency. So they feel like they're not just being told, but you're the story, but yeah, like they have no they have no power to the story yeah. and it, and that had to be a difficult issue yeah and, and hopefully you know uh we hope that's what we did right and i think yeah. that that's the feedback we got from our play testers including yeah. you is that it did not feel like we were um reading them a story um one of the I things mean, that we did stuff like i'll admit like we like i <laughs> If I'm not mistaken, some of your stupid I, stuff worked out really awesome. It, it did. It was great. I loved it. But <laughs> and it made me feel like it was a game at that point because it was like, oh, well, you could try to do that. Here's yeah. what we're gonna try to roll to make it work that way. And the adventure was worth that point. I forget what exactly I did. Something with the Falcon. I know that I yeah, threw I, the Falcon I, out there. You, you, know, you I, had I to deliver that. a message. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah, right. But we won't spoil where and how. Um, yeah, no, yeah, not how. Um, um but yeah, that was that was that was kind of the player agency that we're talking about, uh, and and also creating characters, pre-generated characters that uh, are interesting, so that when you hand them to someone, they're not like, mm, okay, I'm just gonna play what's on the page here. Yeah. Um, and one of the tools we used in that is instead of just handing somebody a pre-generated character, um, and you'll see this is one of the one of our um, uh, uh, example pages when the Kickstarter launches on Tuesday, one of the PDF example pages is one of these. Um, it's, you know, all of our example pages are pre layout. So they're not that we haven't gone right. through layout yet, but it kind of shows you one of the vignettes. And that's how we get the players. That's the tool we get that instead of handing them a character sheet with a history block and only a history block, because there is a backstory block on the character sheet, but we also do a vignette meaning that this part of the adventure, you get to choose some things, you get to be your character, you get to mm. explore, and it's all about you for five, 10 minutes. And that lets all the other players at the table know who your character is. It lets you make them some early on choices about who that character right. is. And then we do those vignettes around the table and then we start the adventure. So that's kind of like a built-in session zero, if you, if you want to look at it like that. Right. Uh, so, I mean... 
for people who have been following the channel for a long time, uh, there we did this when we did our our first charity event. Right. We we took an ep- we took a day and we we made the entire day about that character. And though I wouldn't say you have to do that because that's a long time, but really it wasn't. As you think about it, we did an hour. It was no more than an hour. So if you gave all six players that first, you know, 30 minutes and you did it that way to get everybody understanding what's going on um, before the launch, I think, I think, yeah. or even 15 minutes. Like, I don't, I don't remember exactly how much because also is going to, embellished because of the fact that, that we're not we're doing this in 40 in four in hours four hours we're doing this in, but we i think we gave everybody yeah. 10 minutes even though we only had four hours so that was the first right. hour was vignettes and then the rest right. we did a chapter an hour for the rest of the, the time so mm-hmm. that was very crunched very crunched but if you wanted to use those vignettes and uh, embellish them as your session zero it's yeah. already built in and, right. and that's that's really great the other thing we did to keep engagement going and this will this is a this is one of the things that we want to add in as a, as a, a printable is the co DM model. And we talked about this in episode three, a little bit. Um, there are some, I think the longest is like two and a half pages of box text. Mm-hmm. And that's very, at the very beginning, that's the longest bit of box text. Um, and and James and I did it back and from forth. So from what I felt that was the, that was the initial story of understanding where you're at. Right. Um, and I think that's the danger and the excitement at the same time of these types of books because they're so historic and they've got so much actual history to them that you kind of have to give those heavier inputs than yeah. you than you expect. But I think but, that the, the model that we used yeah. to go back and forth to deliver that content kept the action moving. It wasn't like they're sitting there listening to me read two and a half pages. There's two points of view in those two and a half pages. And I took one point of view and James took the other point of view and seeing how those contrasted back and forth was actually entertaining to the players. And I don't, I hope it didn't feel onerous to listen to that two and a half pages um, because it did turn out to be like seven, eight minutes of just listening to somebody uh, read box text. Um, right. and, and what we want to put in there is a tool so that you can do that. So that if you have a player that you want to be your Mm co-GM, you can hand them this printable material and they don't know what's going to happen, but as a co-GM, they help you with the box text. They help you keep the historical flair. um, And and those things will be uh, one of those printable things that you can print off is like the co-GM script. Right. Yep, exactly. And and it also makes it a lot easier for the GM because then they don't have to sit there and read a couple pages of text yeah. either. Right. right. And when we did it at Genghis, it seemed to work pretty well. You know, I mean, the players were all just like back and forth, really engrossed. I mean, some of that might have been, you know, a lot of names. Right. And and like you said, Heather James, um, you know, Japanese names that you're not going to remember probably and things like that. Um, but it still seemed like it flowed pretty well and everybody seemed interested. So, yeah. Okay, and handouts are going to help with that too. Handouts yeah, with so, people's pictures and and their name underneath it is going to help with that. And I think being being able to extend this from a four hour to you know a couple week long adventure. If you think about it, if you and I, I'm, I'm kind of thinking through this in a, in a school setting. So you know you get an hour long class, break this up into six you know six weeks, test at the end type thing, and but understanding these step processes through it all, breaking it down shouldn't be as daunting, you know. And that's, and, that's and we've done most of that work for you. And you've so, done all that, yeah, yeah, most of the work, yeah. So, does anybody have any questions uh, about all this? I, I, it's an interesting concept to me because it's different. It's not. It's not fantasy. It's not creative writing. It's historic writing, which is so much different when I listened to it than I had even expected, which was great. Yeah, I think, you know, it's something that I've never seen before, right? I mean, we've seen like historical kind of settings, but they still Mm -hmm. were fantasy based, right? Um, But I've never seen like actual historical setting with actual like real life mechanics, basically, Um, you know, no magic, 
no crazy stuff, uh, but yet still enjoyable and hopefully educational, right? Um, because it is history. And and then you add in the, the character progression, so you're not focused on leveling and adding stats and points, mm -hmm. which I'm... I'm a min maxer, so I like that sort of thing. But uh, but this was really interesting to develop because, like Corey said, you know, you you get to make choices that, and those choices develop your character. So your right. two people could play the same character, and we saw this right, and make completely different decisions, and end up right. with different characters by the end yeah. of the adventure. Yeah. So I really like that. And and the other part that that uh, without spoilers that I like about it is uh, no two groups um, tackle the end the same way. Yeah, no two groups. By the time they got through this whole three chapter adventure um, in our playtesting, tackled that end. I'm a quote boss in boss because it's not really a boss. It's kind of more of a challenge. Um, everybody tackled it in different ways and it was very interesting to me to see uh how that played out and and we're hoping that uh you know that appendix to say if you want to continue running this um then yes you can continue running it uh so the question is so historical fiction uh or is it real history which players can influence um a little of both uh, yep oh, our host video cut out but that's all right i used to do this uh, i used to be a host on this show so i can, <laughs> I can so basically it is um a real historical time with real people from history um we did and change a little bit about the base setting um to allow for the fictional aspect of it right um, most of the events that are over, like the overarching events that happen in the adventure are real. Um, but you do get to influence your adventure. Now that doesn't mean you're going to change history, but you're going to, you're going to hopefully have a really yeah. fun adventure within that. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's not like a, a an alternate history thing. Like you're going to change history and then, um, it, you know, uh, becomes an alternate history. Like some of those, uh, like, uh, uh, with the, for all mankind, the, the Apple series about, you know, the Russians making it to the moon first. Mm -hmm. um, it's it's not really that type of thing where you can alter history, but you do get to influence it and you get to, I, only way I can kind of explain is you get to live it, you get to experience it. Um, and some of the overarching things that are happening, you can't really impact. Um, because but, who are you? You're not the heroes, right? You're not super adventurers. Mm -hmm. What you are is people in the time period, right? So you're right. not you're not the daimyo, you're not the the lords, right? You're other people in the world. And so unless you're gonna go and try to assassinate somebody, which you could, you could try. You, <laughs> you know, try. And, then, and then your GM will have to figure out how to do the rest of the story with one of the main characters dead. Um right. <laughs> <laughs> But but the idea is is that it's just like it's a, hopefully more fun being a person in the real world, right? Like how much are we going to change history? Like in general, right? right? I'm not going to go influence the policy of the United States, right? Right. Um, but we can have fun adventures in the United States, right? Right. No, that's interesting, and I think I think you're right. I think it's more of players can influence decisions but not the overall objective right and and the and the way we did that is is we really kind of parallel the adventures um with the historical timeline meaning that the historical timeline is still happening and parallel to that is what the adventurers are experiencing so they choose to do this they choose to do that and they they get to live in that that parallel but the timeline keeps going and then they get to experience different things that would happen if you were in that timeline. Um, you know, I don't think I'm giving too much away here, but no. th th there's one point where uh, there's a siege on on one of the castles, and there are different choices to be made during that siege period. Um, can you 
break the siege? Not really. It's going to happen. Right. Can you, can you get, you know, can you keep it from happening? Probably not. But all the things you get to do because of that um, help you experience, oh, this is what, this is what a siege is like, you know? Right. Um, and that's, that's, that's kind of what we tried to do is take all of these events and then parallel them with the character stories and the character, uh, character and quests more and side of, quests and all of those things. I think more with this specific type of, of storyline and this specific type of genre, it's more understanding and getting the experience of somebody, of the characters themselves and how you can influence the character yeah. rather than it is influencing the story. Uh, which I think is an interesting way to do it. And a lot of times you talk to a lot of game masters and they technically do that in their creative writing. Yeah. Because yes, I guess you could just randomly go kill a guard or go kill the king or whatever. But first off, you better be rolling hot that night because <laughs> in my opinion, you're going to go through some hell in order to even get to that point where you're able to do so. But when it's historic based, and like I said, m nobody really, I guess in the setting that this would be based in and like the people who would be playing, at least I, who I would see playing this, because I don't think people at a game store are going to play this. I think a lot of this is going to be education based. I think a lot of it's going to be people who are just interested in the, the timeline. Um, and people who are interested in history in general, right. and just maybe want a, a different way to see it. Like I said, I think to me personally, it's flipping the, the normal genre upside down, because now this is all about the character. What is the character's motivation? What is the character's change? How can I influence the, the person? Not how can I influence the story? And Though the, the, the thought of railroading, and as much as I hated that years ago, uh, I have grown to understand the reasoning and understanding of what railroading really is and what it isn't. And what it's not is dictating every little thing to change. But in history, you have to dictate certain things to not change because otherwise the history wouldn't make sense. Uh, and I think that is where you guys have done a phenomenal job because I didn't feel like I didn't have player agency, which is what most people complain about with railroading. It's whatever I do is not going to change the story, but that's not the point of this type of a, of a book. This book is to change the character to understand the story. And you have these cool cards, and, which I know I'm not spoiling anything because you'll get the cards and stuff or you'll be able to print them out, that kind of thing. Um, but those give the agency, those give the build up, And I'm sure those cards are not one. Like you don't have one or two cards. You have cards that can be interchangeable <laughs> and, and they all yeah, make sense. Yeah, we don't just have one or two cards. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But that's what I'm saying. So in all honesty, that's where I'm saying that I don't see the railroady portion of it because you have all these different plot lines that you can choose from. And and the other part of this is that you know even though uh, you know chapter two, chapter one is kind of setting up the stuff and then chapter two is a long series of events that leads you to chapter three, which is the the end. And and, and chapter three is very sandboxy. Like there is a lot of things, mm -hmm. a lot of player agency in chapter three, where you get to go explore and talk to this NPC, talk to that NPC, try and figure out what's going on before you figure out what the big boss thing is. And uh, I think in chapter three, it really does come home that you have choice to make with your character. You have things to do. And uh, like with um, Murder and Motley, which I wrote for Gooey Cube, um, at the end, there's this, there's, it's the big baddie isn't just a big bad guy that you have to fight and put it's your stats moral, against it's their a moral stats. Dilemma. There's a dilemma. And, yeah. and there's something you have to think about and go, how are we really going to handle this? Right. Um, which, which, you know, I, I love throwing those at, at the end of a long story because right. you've, 
taken the time to develop these characters and become these characters and you get the chance to then you know um and i would say anybody who does get this book and, and backs it on the kickstarter be ready for that okay time out go ahead and have a conversation because that is going to happen regardless is that there's going to be uh characters in character i saw this every time we ran it in character saying i believe this and somebody else is saying no that's not the way it should be i believe this and those that friction made the made that last chapter just awesome so without i mean, tried I to do that without spoiling anything personally but yeah. <laughs> in my in my play test is i believe a brother and a sister that fought back which was hilarious yeah um that they were legitimately brother and sister and as players but also as characters uh that they were fighting back and forth um with some serious dilemma and i believe i can't remember and i you'll have to correct me if i'm it, wrong it was february there's been a lot of beer since then a lot of beer <laughs> a lot of beer uh let's see i mean it's at least you know 30 episodes well, you know 20 episodes of beer so I mean, I think, you know, the key there is that, like Corey said, it's not just uh, an, the end boss of the dungeon that you're just trying yeah. to kill, right? You have a choice to make. You have multiple choices to make, um, right. I, which could involve just rolling a bunch of dice. But we hope that it's more, uh, it's more, it's a deeper it's, yeah, discussion it's more, than it's that. It's deeper. And I think that is the, I th think that is the ending goal of these types of books. Really, yes. I do. Yeah, because we want you to experience the time frame. We want you to experience the the culture. We want you to experience the challenges of living in that time period. Um, and if we did did just a series of combat encounters and gave them some Japanese flair, uh, I think we'd be doing a disservice to to calling it historical fiction. So I agree. So here's my next. Here's my question to both of you. Let's say this historic fiction book blows up you have enough money and influence to get who, whatever time period you want what time period would be the one you personally would want to do next all right james i'll let you go first i mean for me it's japan is my passion right so i would want to i would want to pick a different daimyo Right and and do another adventure based in in the Warring States period, ideally. Nice, because um, I think that's where the most interesting things happen, um, from like adventure perspective. perspective uh, is yeah, is that hundred kind of the 1500 to 1600 that that period? Yeah, there's so much because it was just back oh, and yeah. forth across the entire con continent and across the entire island chain. Um, that's the one thing I did learn about. <laughs> in college was yeah. it was like 1400 to 1600 was just well this yeah. guy's dead no this guy took over no this guy's dead no this guy took over. i'm like but it, like it started kind of slow and then it ramped up and by oh, 1550 yeah. it was just on all over yep <laughs> so, so japan for james you yeah so it? so I, i've been that's why i had him go first because i had to think hard about this one um i i think I think just because I would like to see uh, a contrast to like American th thought, right? Yeah. Um, I would, I would think if I could pick any time, and and this would be just an experiment in learning for myself, right? And trying to convey this time period and this right. lifestyle. But like uh, I said, you I, also this would be you have the influence to reach out to and get research, you know, yeah, and all super this. super genius of this time period that understands it all. I I think I would do the USSR during the Cold War, and mm. take a different point of view on the Cold Cold War that would be amazing to portray as accurately as i could like so seeing like, it on so, like their, late 50s it from their side yeah that would be interesting to see what that the space race looks like from their side from before sputnik yeah yeah huh. that'd be that'd be really interesting yeah but you know hey like i said it's all i'm not i'm not doing it for me i'm doing it for the people who want to use these books so it, like it, i said you know, i think that's interesting 
the comment though, because we see it always as from our side. Yeah. You know, from the United States side, looking outward, this is how we see most things. It'd be interesting to have somebody or have a group of people that understand the other side. You know, yeah. what were they feeling? Mm -hmm. What was going through their head? What was this? What was the emotion going on during the Cold War? Personally, I was not born anywhere near it, so I would never know. But in, and I don't think we ever get that opportunity. And I think that would be an interesting. I, I really do. I think that would be an interesting opportunity. I think any of those, you know, taking it from an actual like native viewpoint, I think yeah. is mm -hmm. so beneficial. I mean, you know, for me with the Japan passion, obviously I lived in Japan for nine years and yeah. I, I I didn't quite go native, but pretty pretty close. Pretty darn close. Um, yeah. You know, and and I had lots and lots of deep conversations with elderly Japanese people who were who were more than happy to tell me all about their side of say World War II <laughs> or, you know, in, anything in yeah. as well, well as the warring states period. And the perspectives that I got were just so different than anything I had ever heard and it was fascinating. You know, and yeah. and that's I think good it's history can show giving... those multiple perspectives. Well, it's interesting cuz you're giving an ability to cultural to improve your cultural understanding without having that opportunity, which I think is right. awesome because not everybody's going to have the opportunity to go live in Japan and for ten years and be able to dive that deep into the culture. I mean, I lived in I lived in South Korea for a year, loved the culture, loved the understanding of it. I still can only speak about a dozen words and though modernized you know english has become kind of the universal language in a lot of places when you start speaking to people who have lived in these time periods or who have passed down knowledge of these time periods they're not telling them in english they're telling them in their native tongue they're telling them in their native thought process and a lot of those people have a different way that they think and understand life and i think if you don't if you can't grasp that and you can't push those understandings into a book like this then you're doing the book a disservice because of the fact that you're trying to hit it from that angle and i think that's yeah. just an interesting yeah, it, opportunity it, and, and you know i'm gonna toot james's horn for him a little bit he he learned japanese before moving to japan uh Good job. and then and you know uh he you know on when he was on this this side of, of of that travel in the U.S., still he's like, "Oh yeah, I got this." And then when he got over there, it, he realized, "Okay, I'm not so fluent, even though I passed all the tests." Um, and, <laughs> and, I passed all the tests. <laughs> so it took you about know, a year before I really started to gain fluency. Yeah. So you know, and and I mean, I took four years of German, and I still it would probably take me another six months in Germany to understand and be able to regain some of those those skills. And I think having that content expert, that person, you know, who, I mean, two things. One, I've got James to help be that content expert because he spent yeah. 10 years there. But then I also, he can bounce any ideas off his wife who grew up there. So right. it's, you know, I think that if, if we were to do a different time period, and back to your question that you asked, um, if we had any number of resources, I would have to find a content expert that at least knew about living in Russia and had at least spent time studying the Russian history and right. with the USSR and all of that in the Cold War. And so that that interest was there. So, you know, I, I it, when when I say it's up to, you know, our fans, it's also up to what resources we can get that well, you can, can be those them. content experts right um and you know which is, off... where, which is why i said it the way i did because yeah. i know you guys have talked about you know somebody brought up aztec adventures somebody brought up you know uh african culture that kind of stuff those are deep and they're much different than the united states culture is yeah. and well not only that you know what one of the things i really learned uh <laughs> The hard way when I was in Japan is that language shapes culture, mm -hmm. right? And you can learn about a culture all you want in your own language, but when you learn that culture's language, 
all of a sudden everything becomes real and there's all these um these contextual shades, things yeah yeah these contextual things with the language that really shape how people think um right. and you know I, I i'm not native but i did you know i i am fluent in japanese and so i spent a lot of time learning about that, that portion trying to understand it at least and and yeah. like Corey said my wife is japanese she's native japanese um and so i spent a lot of time discussing stuff with her as well to make sure that i was i was correct in my understanding of mm. things you know based on the language and the culture as i understood it um right. because i think for anything like this the historical fiction especially to, to what kind of build on what Corey said earlier if we're not as accurate as we can be while still allowing for that you know adventure uh, mm -hmm. then we're really doing a service to not only the yeah. people who are playing it but the culture that we're trying the to the culture represent. that you're trying to yeah. present yeah and that's where i think when we talked about the and it's kind of why i rotated the the question differently than i did at the beginning of the show after listening to what you guys were saying and understanding more so the thought process behind historic fiction I can almost state, and the, I mean, this is my own personal opinion, is that the only culture that you guys can personally do well at this point with just the two of you would be feudal Japan, because you don't have that cultural expertise Correct. for any other culture. And it would take years and years and years of or, premature or, study. Or finding a partner. You or know, finding and, a partner. And, and I've, Correct. I t when I talked about this with uh, Stefan, one of the contributors at, at, at Gooey Cube, who's got a... I think he's got a master's maybe maybe a phd, he has a PhD sure, in, in in african african uh, PhD. history yes that um, so PhD. you know i would need somebody like him to right. help with with the the a different thing um and and i feel like when it comes to the historical side of this this book behind me that was all james um and what i contribute to this is more the game-based learning side the game-based learning practices uh the the authorship of trying to make these characters and and really and there were tons of com conversations i had with james about okay would this character do this i'm writing this little scenario would this be out of character would this, would this make be, sense would this make sense and there were a lot of those conversations that happened um you know as as we were writing this thing uh and you know uh, and then there were some that i just said i i don't know james you got to write this part you know i i <laughs> i have no clue how to write this and, see i think that's interesting in that person that i can understand because even in a non-historic version of this there's been a lot of times where i have done that with you i've done that with the co-author that i did for our newest gooey cube adventure that i had to write and those were those questions those were the when people state like how many hours did it take you to write a book, it doesn't calculate the hours upon hours of conversation that you had that you never put a thing down on a piece of paper because you're talking through these these questions. And like I personally can state the first month, month and a half of us getting our adventure uh, in GUI Cube, I I wrote maybe a couple couple paragraphs max because it was going through how we wanted the adventure to be written, what was the tone you wanted, and with historic fiction, it can it's got to even be heavier because, okay, this is the tone we want to set, this is the direction we want to go. Well, now I got to pull out you know, seventeen history books and start figuring out what history needs to be in this book. You know mm -hmm. what needs to already be there before we start diving into the adventure portion of it. And now, now um, luckily, James did yeah. all of that research with that tome that he showed earlier. <laughs> so, <Exactly>. we had, <laughs> so you had that. And well, like we had said, to give it was character. Interesting right. dynamic here because you had the historic expertise that we just talked about. And then Corey, I'm going to toot Corey's horn right now, you know, 20 some years of building games, maybe more than that now. I don't know. Corey's. Corey's older than 1997. I don't, I, I don't know. You added up. Yeah. Yeah. You know, 97, 2007, 2017, 2020. I mean, almost 30 years. Let's go with that. Almost 30 years of, of gaming experience in building games. Uh, this together was an awesome partnership that you two put together because, like I yeah, said, I, mean, I, I didn't 
feel like I was in his history class other than the first like five minutes because that's just a lot of content for me yeah. to, to well, listen it, to at one time. It, it took both of us, right? I mean, Corey, like you just said, is a genius at game design, in my opinion. Um, and yeah. so he really made this an, a fun adventure, right? <laughs> like I could do the history stuff and, and my tome yeah. was not terribly interesting, right? It was a lot of history. <laughs> and then, we, you know, I was just kind of bombarding and with history when we ran it together. Um, but he, you know, took the idea and really fleshed it out with me to yeah. make it a, a game um, that I think we're both really proud of. Um, yeah. And, and I, I thought it was awesome running it. I'd love to, you know, be a, a character and although I know everything that happens, but <laughs> I would have enjoyed playing it. <laughs> yeah. And like I said, with me not knowing anything and having the opportunity. So for anybody who has yet to see me at a con, I go 160 miles an hour in every direction and people hate me for it because I disappear and reappear and I, I'm a magician when it comes to conventions. But Corey was like, no, I've got open spot. And I was like, you know what? I'm just going to sit down and play this game. And I will say that it was one of the, one of the most fun I've had at a convention just sitting down and playing a game because normally I don't, first, I don't get the opportunity. And second, it was a, it was an amazing adventure that I got the opportunity to play. And, Mind and, you, I probably wouldn't play it more than once because it's a lot of history. But, but and, and the, you know, one of the questions that came from uh, some of our people who are previewing uh, the Kickstarter for us, um, one of the questions that came up is, are you going to do any live plays during the Kickstarter? And I really can't because we can't, doing a live play is all the story. Yeah, it's it, there's it would just be one big spoiler. Yeah. Um, the play on the other hand, if you want James and I to run it for you, there is a special, uh, very, very high tier. Um, come to the, come to Colorado, uh, get a, a, a mountain house and James and I show up every day and, and run game for you. Whether you want us to run this game for you or, or different games for you, it doesn't matter, but we do have that as one of our, our higher tiers at the Kickstarter. If you want to, uh, Take now, a trip now, to Colorado. Me, let me make sure I understand this right. Are you talking James him or James me? Because if you would James talk, him. okay. <laughs> I was like, I was like, we've had this conversation before, and I was like, hold up. I was not told that I was going to be flying out to Colorado <laughs> to do this. My, I will do it. Well, and, 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 if, not... and if that's a little rich for you, we have a slightly lower tier that is we'll run the game for you online for yeah. you and your your party. Yeah. Yeah. And if it's historic based. Um, you you to take this and run with it. I yeah. would I would hate to just in in with no better words than chop this thing up like garbage by trying to pronounce all those words. Now I would be horrible at it unless I took you know two months to understand all of the enunciations and stuff like that. I, I'm still asking for clarification. I, I know. Yeah, I I'm watched. still. It's great. <laughs> and I've already <laughs> written all the phonetic stuff too. So, but like I said definitely check out the kickstarter if you please this costs absolutely nothing go on the kickstarter today tell your friends hit that notify button that just pushes them higher up in the algorithm and it means so much to these guys who have put so much time and energy into this book um, and this gives me a great way to segment into something even gr just as awesome though a little less, well, I guess, let me rephrase that, a little more showy, I guess would be the right. best way to put it, is our wonderful fan Corey here is going to be our main GM. Uh, he is my, as I said, my right-hand man for mostly everything Tabletop Misfits does. And he will be taking the limelight as the GM for most of Plots of Dark and Haven, which is our new project coming out in July. So July 10th, Plots of Dark and 10th, Haven. Episode one yep. of Plots of Dark and Haven. That is my my pitch for the night. Uh, <laughs> hey, so, it's my pitch too. I'm running the game and I want everybody right, to you come are, enjoy it. And we've got and uh, it's 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 uh hopefully you you will enjoy uh watching. Uh, and the good thing about Plots and Dark and Haven, it is is episodic. We have new guests every week. Um and you, unlike and there's gonna be some 
plot threads that will tie episode to episode. Uh, but like a episodic, you know, TV show that you might watch, you can sit down and grab an episode uh, of, of CSI Miami and not have to know, have watched every previous episode. Um, not that Plots in Dark and Haven is like CSI in any way. Um, but no, yeah, no bad puns. unless you like CSI, then yes, it's of course, it's, <laughs> it's exactly like CSI you need to come watch. <laughs> <laughs> so um yeah I, I i hope everybody enjoys it I, unfortunately we don't have any more empty slots we have filled all of our guest star slots for season season one uh there are 12 episodes uh going all the way to uh september i think september 25th is our last episode um and then we will uh be gearing up for season two um but we'll talk about that once we get season later, one done. Later. Yeah. <laughs> Let's not spoil too much. CSI, CSI Dark Haven. Dark yeah, Haven. Right. <laughs> uh, but yeah. Um, yeah, so without without spoiling too much of that, that starts July 10th, 9 p.m. East Standard Time, Sunday. Uh, we will be starting our first episode of season one of Plots and Dark Haven. I might be on it. I might not. It depends on if my character is drawn up yet or not. But if it's not, that's fine. We have an amazing cast. We have a big cast. Oh my goodness, we have such a big cast. Something that everybody has told me is one of the most different things that they've ever heard is the fact that our cast was projected to be three different game masters and 16 players. The players we caught, every we have tons of players due to real life issues and situations our game masters has died, died down a little bit though the two other game masters myself included um, will have influence and be working with Corey on the direction of plots and dark and haven we're not doing this one person drives this whole project because this project is massive um, well, Darkenhaven is massive. It's a huge city. It's, a, the it's going to be the best. Insane. Yeah, it's going to be the biggest, uh, biggest, coolest fantasy city ever put into a box set. I, I, I thoroughly yeah. believe that. Not to toot Gooey Cube's horn anymore. I said but... I can't say it's the biggest because there's that one that's like massive, like a thousand page book of a city, but it's not going to have the artwork. It's not going to have the NPCs. It's not going to have. Yeah five different books that make different pieces of the world come together not to mention if we want to get technical dark and haven is a two box set so yes yeah dark and haven and going for it <laughs> so um my last little bit i threw the uh kickstarter link in yes. in in the, the stream chat uh like james said it does it, it costs you nothing and it, it helps us nothing. in the algorithm to um to click that link and, and say follow uh, and then, you know, it helps us out on day one when we launch next Tuesday um, to get that, get us Tuesday. boosted. Oh, my in goodness. It's so soon. close. It's, yeah, it's right around the corner. We'll, uh, we'll, but I'm, I'm, I'm so, so excited for you guys. You guys have put so much hours and hours and hours of time and energy into this. I've talked to Corey multiple times and he's like, you know, I'm flying out here to do this for a weekend or I'm, or I'm, I'm busy all weekend because I'm working on the book. Uh, I get kind of some some of Corey's time back now to to prep for plots and dark and even now. Well, that depends on how many stretch stretch goals are made. Exactly, that's it true. depends on the Kickstarter, <laughs> which is fine because that means hopefully this Kickstarter will fund a little bit of our project. <laughs> uh, but you two are always a joy to talk to. I cannot wait until next year, James. I don't think you're going to make you be at Gen Con either. I don't think so. No. So Genghis Khan next year in February. I'm looking forward to hanging out with both of you again. And uh, yeah, 2023 is quickly approaching. And um, I don't know where this world, where this crazy thing called tabletop role-playing games and D&D &D will take us, but... Might be the I'm only thing we can to... afford to do. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, with gas prices and food going through the roof right now stay at home roll uh, dice that's right there you go yeah there's my there's if my you can afford plug. internet home, you can roll dice. roll dice with people on the internet <laughs> yeah so um one plug i guess since that just came up that if you if you really need a game master 
please reach out. I do professional game mastering on, on, on the side. Uh, I can send you my quote and everything. We can sit down and talk. Uh, but, and I do everything through Foundry and through Incarnate and through uh, Sirenscape. I've got all the crazy tools that you need to run an online game. Uh, and I run two games weekly. So, and I've been running them for over two and a half years now. And both teams are still dead, dead set on coming back every week to, to continue their, their adventures. Not to mention we have wonderful people through the Misfits that have uh, ran games with me for me. So, oh, wow. That hour went quick. <laughs> So before we go, uh, if we can just roll our our second pitch for the night, if you can just roll the intro for Plots of Dark Haven, we'll we'll call it after this. Ask for final questions. Mind you, you kind of took the video I did for the portables and just edited it. Hey, you know, I, I just made it better. <laughs> oh, I'll remember that. I just took what you did and fixed it and made it good. Yeah, I just it did it good. I took what I did and fixed it, added more fire, because apparently that's all we do is turn things out of the ground. <laughs> right. But all right. once again, thank you both for coming. This is Last Call. Does anybody in the chat room have any questions for Corey, James, or myself? Going once, going twice, and sold to the man in the orange shirt. With All right, beer. thank you, thank you for your time. Thanks for having us on, and thank Make everybody sure. for uh, checking it, checking us out at, on our Kickstarter. So, yep, head thank over you. to the Kickstarter, hit that notice button, uh, and we will see you guys all next week. Our guest next week is Shadow, who is also a returning guest. Uh, and we're going to talk about horror games next week. So it is a it is a an item he's been passionate about, and we're looking forward to hearing his thought process on how to implement horror and terror, and you know, kind of like the the Halloween feel for uh, for games. So we'll find out all the nits, uh, neat tips and tricks to make your game scarier and more gruesome. And, We'll find that out all next week. And if you're bored on Sunday until Plots and Dark and Haven comes out, we're going to continue our ridiculous gallivant through Baldur's Gate 3, uh, where four of us try to at least TPK once a night. So it's kind of weird. <laughs> but we will see you guys all next week. It's been wonderful talking with all of you, and good night. <laughs>